Hello and welcome to English 1302 Writing and Rhetoric here at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. I'm Dr. Eric Luttrell and I'll be your professor for the next 15 weeks. So what do you think of when you think of a writing class? A lot of people think of a process of starting with a conclusion and looking for ways, looking for information, looking for a format that you can use to make that conclusion persuasive to other people. You may have learned uh, formats like the five paragraph essay in uh, high school or maybe even sooner where you have a, a paragraph that introduces uh, a major topic with three subtopics and then you have a paragraph for each of those three subtopics and then you have a conclusion that basically just repeats what you just said. That sort of format is easy to sort of pour any idea into. In fact, you don't even need an idea. You can just pour a, a topic and just come up with like subtopics, uh, whether anyone was interested in that topic or not. But that sort of thing, starting with a conclusion and just pouring information into a particular rhetorical format, that's not what we're going to do in this class. Uh, that's something we're going to have to rethink. In fact, uh, rethinking is going to be the sort of uh, first and most critical part of this class. We have four main goals for this class. Uh, the first is to distinguish between motivated reasoning and critical reasoning. And critical reasoning is a term you're going to hear a lot. You've probably heard a lot already. Uh, people use it all the time. But what do we really mean by critical reasoning? Uh, a lot of people will use that term just to mean, well, you know, smart reasoning, uh, being intelligent. And critical reasoning isn't just being smart. Uh, it is being smart, but it's a particular kind of intelligence. Uh, we all can use intelligence to uh, critically evaluate an idea that we're not really that attached to, an argument that someone else makes that we don't necessarily believe in ourselves, uh, especially if we disagree in it. We're really good at showing that, oh, that information is inaccurate or that reason does not lead to that conclusion. When it's somebody else's, when we're not invested in it. But when it's our own uh, assumption, our own belief, our own foregone conclusion, we're not very good at critically evaluating the argument that supports it. In fact, we're motivated to cherry pick uh, data. We're motivated to use logical fallacies to make that conclusion seem like it's the only uh, or the best one uh, while ignoring counter evidence, evidence that we'd rather not uh, have to contend with. And when we do that, we're doing the opposite of critical reasoning. That's called motivated reasoning. We're motivated to get to a foregone conclusion. So we're all capable of critical reasoning, but how often do we actually use it? And how often do we instead fall back on motivated reasoning? Well, this is something that psychologists and anthropologists and uh, several others have begun to study over the past few decades. And the answers they found are not entirely encouraging. The psychologist Jonathan Haidt compares the way the human mind works to a lawyer riding on the back of an elephant. The elephant in this metaphor is all of the background cognition that the brain is doing at any given point. Uh, the generalizations, uh, the stereotypes, the heuristics, uh, these sorts of uh, vague assumptions about the world that you use to get through a day, and most of the time they work fine, but they might be a little bit simplistic. They might be a little bit overgeneralized. Cognition, in this sense, is the sort of thinking you don't really think about, if that makes any sense. Uh, if someone tosses you a basketball, you can catch it without stopping and thinking, that is a basketball. It is coming toward me. I should put my hands up and catch it. Uh, that background cognition is capable of taking care of that. And it's capable of doing other things throughout the day, opening doors, uh, even driving home. If you've ever caught yourself uh, not paying attention to a, a drive from the time you get in your car, start the engine and uh, get out on the road to the time you turn home, you probably didn't uh, consciously think about, uh, here's a red light, so I need to stop. It's green now, I can go. I should turn left at this uh, street and right at the next street. Um, you just sort of think about something else and then all of a sudden you're home. Uh, that background cognition is capable of doing quite a lot. And in Height's metaphor, uh, that's the elephant. The elephant knows where it's going and knows what it wants. Uh, the lawyer on the back isn't steering the elephant. But sometimes if the elephant gets out of control, if the elephant uh, goes barreling down a city street and uh, knocking over bicycles and making pedestrians jump out of the way, stopping traffic, uh, breaking windows, that sort of thing, uh, the lawyer can't stop it. He can't redirect it. He can't steer it. Uh, all he can do is make a rationalization for what the elephant has already done. He can say, well, you shouldn't have left your bike there, and uh, you shouldn't uh, be on this sidewalk. You should cross the street to get out of the elephant's way. Or 
you know, that window, uh, you know, shouldn't have been there. So there's an argument being made. There's reasoning happening. This is not reasoning that is leading to a conclusion. The conclusion has already happened. The reasoning is just following along behind, trying to make the, uh, the action, the uh, thought, the outcome uh, seem as if it was something deliberate, as if it was the right thing to do, uh, in order to persuade other people after the fact. And Hyde is not alone in this characterization. Uh, many psychologists, anthropologists, uh, cognitive scientists, uh, philosophers, uh, behavioral economists over the past decade or so have, through independent studies, been coming toward basically the, the same uh, characterization of the human brain. We're capable of a lot of very intelligent reasoning, but we typically use it to validate foregone conclusions that weren't very good in the first place. And the goal seems to be just to be persuasive. Some have even speculated from this research that human beings develop the capacity to reason consciously, not in order to uh, make decisions in the future, but in order to present themselves to uh, a social group in the best light possible, uh, persuading other people to do what we want them to do for our own sake, uh, rather than what they might want to do or what's good for the larger group. And people who had that ability would have a selection advantage over people who did not. But of course, we would have to develop critical thinking to understand other people that might be trying to deceive us. Uh, so that faculty emerges, it's just not something we use on ourselves. While, this, uh, th while the scientific data that uh, creates this characterization is mostly very recent, this awareness of our own sort of propensity to self-deception is not new. This is the key insight that Socrates had almost 2,500 years ago. Socrates was famous not for what he knew, necessarily, more for what he knew that he didn't know. Uh, he was famous because he set out on a mission to sort of uh, figure out or question the things that were taken for granted. Some of the big questions, but also some of the small questions that everybody just sort of assumed that they already had the answers to. Uh, he would question those answers and he would go to the experts and he would find out, well, actually the experts uh, don't always have a, a clear idea or a really good, logically sound reason for the conclusions that they hold. And it was through these investigations that a lot of the insights that people like Socrates and later Plato, Aristotle, and uh, later philosophers uh, actually came to the, the insights that they were famous for, it started not with uh, a foregone conclusion that they thought they had to persuade everybody about, but realizing that a lot of the assumptions they held uh, needed to be rethought, uh, investigated, and reworked into a more uh, accurate and testable form. This class is designed to send you out on a similar Socratic quest. Uh, in this class, we're going to learn a lot about the psychological, sociological, uh, cognitive biases, uh, problems in uh, understanding new things and then communicating those things. I'll cover that in video lectures and you'll read articles uh, about that sort of thing and then uh, take quizzes about it. But after that, and the point of that is that you're also going to choose an issue for investigation, uh, something that you're going to... Uh, gather sources talking about a particular issue, analyze those sources, their, their rhetorical structure, uh, compare them to other sources that might uh, take a different position and make a different argument in that same issue, uh, then make your own foray into that issue, make your own argument, uh, arguing for a particular conclusion, uh, then looking at different strategies for creating an argument that can get through people's uh, motivated reasoning, get through their barriers, uh, to uh, get people to, to see things that they don't necessarily want to see. All of this is going to come from your particular investigation of an issue that is completely up to you. Uh, whatever issue uh, you decide to investigate is going to be up to you, but it has to actually be an issue. It can't just be a topic. Uh, you're not just providing information. Uh, you're setting out to understand something that people don't totally understand, people don't totally agree with. Uh, this might be something that's very controversial, or it might just be something that uh, people think they know enough about that actually, you know, they, they may not. And each of the writing projects, each of the essays, uh, and the annotated bibliography, and the uh, peer review assignments that you'll uh, write and submit, and uh, you'll receive feedback from your classmates, 
each of these builds on the research that you've done on your issue, the writing that you've done on that issue, uh, each of that, each project stacks on top of the previous one in order to allow you to build up a certain repertoire of expertise about this issue while you find new ways to uh, understand it and new ways to communicate it. So to get started, if you haven't already, uh, you'll want to go to the class's Blackboard site. And as with every class, the first thing you're going to want to do is read the syllabus. Now you can get to the syllabus by clicking the link on the left and the menu on the left. And this is where you'll find out my information. My information has been redacted here uh, because this is on YouTube. But you can uh, find my email address if you need to email me directly. Uh, my office location, uh, my telephone in my office. Uh, I only answer the telephone in my office when I'm in my office during office hours. Uh, it's possible to leave a message, but sometimes that message doesn't always get to me. So um, the best time to use the telephone is during my office hours, uh, which are uh, posted directly below that on the uh, syllabus on Blackboard. Um, but outside of office hours, uh, the best way to contact me is probably through email. Uh, here also is listed the textbook that's required for this class. Uh, the book is called Naming What We Know. Uh, you should be able to find a lot of these in the uh, TAMU CC bookstore. Uh, every composition class requires the same textbook. You will find the grade distribution that tells you how much uh, each major writing assignment is worth and collectively how much the peer review assignments and the quizzes are worth. Uh, this class has been converted to a point system so that uh, these percentages aren't going to be exact, but this is pretty close to what each one is worth. Uh, after the syllabus, so you should read the entire syllabus. I'm not going to go over every bit of it now, but uh, I'm going to go over the, the, the major points. Uh, be sure in this class and in every other class, read the entire syllabus uh, as soon as possible. After the syllabus, the most important link on here is the schedule. Uh, this is where you'll see what we'll be doing each week, uh, what you need to read, what videos you need to watch, what assignments are due, uh, and it'll also allow you to look ahead. For the purposes of the course, a week uh, last from Monday at noon until the following Monday at 11.59 a.m. So Monday mornings for the rest of the semester are going to be sort of the, the time when you can turn in uh, the last bits of the previous week. That means that some assignments from the previous week can be done over the weekend and will be accepted on Monday before 12 noon. I uh, try to set the class up so that people who work 9 to 5 during the week can do the majority of the work on the weekend and then uh, turn it in uh, by Monday at noon before starting the next week. Uh, however, there will be some exceptions, some things that have to be done by Wednesday night. And when you check the schedule on uh, Blackboard, you'll see dates here, whereas uh, I have left the dates off for this uh, tutorial video. I'll also make weekly announcements on Monday morning to remind you that this is due uh, on Wednesday, this is due the following Monday, uh, what you need to be doing during that week. Those announcements will appear on the announcement section, which you can get to on the left-hand menu there on Blackboard, but they'll also be sent out as emails. It's best to do the readings and viewing the videos and uh, doing the assignments in the order that they're listed in the schedule. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes I'll have readings listed first and then lecture videos later, and if that's the case, then in that lecture video, I'm going to presume you've already read the reading that's listed above it. Uh, if an assignment is posted, it may presume that you have already read uh, the previously listed material and are ready to either take a quiz on it or uh, write about it in a peer review assignment. So each week will contain lecture videos in which I'll talk about the concepts and material for the class. Uh, the links to those videos, uh, the YouTube links are listed on the uh, schedule of readings. When you watch these videos, take notes. I know it's YouTube. Uh, we tend to fall into that passive entertainment mode, but treat this as a, a university college classroom lecture. Uh, have a notebook. I recommend a paper notebook rather than just typing it. Uh, studies have shown that uh, people who have to actually write down with a pencil and paper or a pen and paper uh, retain the information a lot better than people who type it out. I'll usually uh, put 
key terms in a red font so you know that you definitely need to write those terms down. Uh, that those are the kinds of terms that can show up again on a, a quiz and they're the kind of terms that I'll use in assignments and presume that you know uh, what they mean and how to uh, use them. Because it's on YouTube you can uh, pause the lecture uh, to to write things down. Uh, you can go back and repeat part of the lecture, obviously, uh, but you can also speed it up if you're, especially if you're reviewing a lecture that you've already watched, uh, the, uh, on the menu bar on the bottom of the YouTube video, you'll see that little gear, you click on the gear, you can change the speed to like, you know, 1.5 times the, the usual speed. If you're, you know, if you want to turn uh, an hour long video into a 45 minute video, you'll also see listed the, uh, authors, titles, and links to the readings. Most of the readings are not going to be in the textbook, naming what we know. They're mostly going to be online readings, uh, like this one. Uh, the, the first one is Jerome Groupman's uh, article, The Mistakes Doctors Make, which is uh, an article in the Boston Globe, and there's the link to the Boston Globe. Some of these sources, like the New York Times, will have a uh, uh, a limit to how many free articles you can get if you're not a subscriber. So uh, if you run into a, a paywall, if it says you have seen all the five free articles you can see this month, uh, usually you can switch to another browser and it will start over again. Uh, so sometimes there will be more than one New York Times article in a, a particular uh, week. Uh, there usually will be in, in a month. So if you're if you start clicking through other articles, you might use those up. Uh, if that happens, uh, you know you could switch computers, or you could just uh, most of the time you could switch to uh, another browser. If you're using Firefox, switch over to Safari or Chrome or something like that. If you don't see a link uh, next to a, a reading. Uh, it may be one that has been posted or uploaded on Blackboard. So if you just see BB in parentheses, you can click on the BB and it should open an Adobe PDF uh, in your browser, uh, or you can download it as a PDF. And then the others without links are uh, short articles in naming what we know with the page numbers listed. And again, you'll have to get a paper copy of that book at the bookstore. Although there is also a... Uh, uh, Kindle version uh, and maybe other uh, ebook forms. Uh, in that case, the, the page numbers may not work, but you've got the section number like, you know, 5.3 or whatever. You'll notice at the end of this week, uh, we have a, the, our first quiz. And by the end of this week, I mean it is due at uh, 12 noon next Monday. Now, you can do that anytime between now and then. The quiz is already open, but uh, it will no longer, you'll, you'll no longer be able to submit it after uh, 12 noon um, next Monday. Uh, the quizzes are there to make sure you're uh, gaining the, the necessary comprehension of the concepts that are discussed in the articles. So the articles, the lecture videos are going to cover uh, a lot of material about uh, how we think, how we write, how we read, how miscommunication happens, and how to overcome that. Uh, those key concepts and the examples used in those articles are going to be things that you want to take notes on and then uh, be prepared to uh, discuss them or at least recognize them on the quiz. The quizzes are all multiple choice. Uh, there's rarely more than four choices to choose from. Uh, there will be ten questions. You'll have ten minutes to take it uh, once you begin. To get to the quiz, uh, go click on uh, quizzes on the left-hand menu. Uh, once you're there, you'll see the quiz for that week appear. Right now, the only quiz that appears is quiz one. Uh, next week, uh, the quiz two will appear. Uh, you won't be able to take quiz one after uh, the due date, but you will be able to go back and review it after the due date. Uh, to get to, to begin the quiz, sometimes it's kind of hard to, to tell. You actually have to click on the title. This is a problem with a lot of Blackboard uh, assignments. Uh, you, you see the description and you don't see anything that looks like a link, but you can actually click on the title for that assignment, or in this case, that quiz. Uh, anytime during that week, between now and the due date, uh, you can begin. But once you begin, you have 10 minutes. And that 10-minute uh, clock is uh, ticking uh, no matter if you click away from the page, you turn, the, or you click off the browser, uh, if you lose your internet connection, uh, the, the timer is still going. So uh, no matter what happens on your computer, 10 minutes from the time you begin the quiz, it 
expires and you won't be able to do anything else. That's why it's very important that you have a secure internet connection and that you are free from distractions. Nobody's going to come in and distract you, ask you to do something, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't recommend trying to take the quiz from the Blackboard app on your phone. Uh, there have been a lot of problems with that in the past. Uh, some, uh, a lot of uh, people have complained they couldn't even access the quiz. So uh, your best, uh, best way to do it is to uh, do it on a computer. Uh, I recommend that you use your handwritten notes. There's, uh, I don't consider that cheating. I encourage my face-to-face -face classes to do that. Uh, but in my face-to-face -face class, I will only allow students to use their handwritten notes. Uh, anything they've copied and, or any text documents, uh, anything like that, I don't allow. Uh, the way the quiz is set up, uh, you know, you're on your own as to, you know, what sort of notes you're using. But if you're not familiar with the material, you're not going to be able to answer the questions in the amount of time given. If you're familiar with the material, you'll be able to answer the questions in that uh, time frame. And if you've written notes, you're already familiar with the material, so you may not even need them, but you can use them. Back on the schedule, you'll see the peer review assignments are listed in pairs. There's a peer review 1A and peer review 1B. That's because each peer review has two phases. Uh, the first phase is the submission phase. This is when you are uh, giving your own answers uh, or writing about uh, your own work in progress. During the submission phase, you write uh, your portion and you uh, upload it and you have to have that in before the submission phase ends. When the submission phase ends, the uh, peer evaluation phase begins and at that point uh, there's no possibility of a new submission uh, because Blackboard has to uh, assign other students in the class uh, the su submissions to review, uh, the submissions of their peers. That means that there's no possibility of uh, a late submission. On most weeks, there is a peer review submission that's due on Wednesday night at midnight, and then the uh, evaluation, peer evaluation period uh, will go from uh, Thursday morning until uh, the following Monday at noon. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes there is a, a submission due on a Monday and the evaluation is due on Wednesday. Uh, just be sure that you've uh, kept up with the schedule to be sure what's due on that week. To get to the uh, individual peer review assignment, uh, click on the, uh, the tab on the left. You'll see the submission and evaluation dates uh, posted for each of the assignments. Uh, you can submit before the submission date. Uh, you have to submit within that window. Uh, you can't uh, submit anything after the submission date ends. To, uh, to begin the process, to begin the submission, click View Complete Assignment. And then once you're in, you'll have that problem of finding the link again. Uh, in this case, to answer question one, you have to click on question one. Uh, it doesn't look like a link, but it is. Then once the submission phase is over and the peer evaluation phase begins, when you uh, click on the same assignment, it will take you to this screen. You'll have links for each of the students whose work that you're going to review. Uh, it may have the student's name or it may just say user one and user two. Uh, click on that, either the name or user1 or user2, and it will take you to the, that student's submission. It will look something like this. Uh, in this case, there are four questions, and uh, you'll have to uh, click that uh, up at the top. You have to click through for each question so that you can review, evaluate, and give points for each question. Uh, you'll read your peer submission. Uh, below that is the criteria that I'll put up there. I'll say when you're uh, evaluating your peer, uh, be sure you look for these things. Uh, be sure that they don't do this or make this mistake. Be sure that they follow uh, this or have this uh, minimum criteria. Uh, then you will make comments. You'll make suggestions, uh, maybe point out uh, where they could have done something differently or make suggestions about, uh, you know, information or research that they might want to do. Uh, and then give them uh, points. It'll uh, say how much, how many points uh, maximum, and anywhere between zero and usually three to five. It's just going to be a few points, just enough so that you can let them know, you know, this criteria was or was not met. Uh, the purpose of the peer review is so that you can give and get feedback uh, from other people in the, in the class. Uh, 
on a few of these assignments, it will be about conceptual material uh, from case studies and that sort of thing. Most of the time, it will be uh, you writing about your research project and getting feedback from somebody else, getting another opinion, getting someone else saying, uh, you could have phrased that differently. This might offend somebody. Uh, oh, did you know about this resource? Uh, just uh, the closest thing we can have to a conversation uh, in an online class. And we depend on each other to get ourselves out of our own uh, habituation of thoughts, our own presumptions, our own heuristics, uh, our own sort of uh, cognitive biases, motivated reasoning. We need other people to look at what we've written and say, uh, here's how you might consider doing that differently. You will be assigning each other grades, but I will then be going over those grades to make sure that they're justified, uh, to make sure that somebody didn't by mistake or through callousness give you a, a low grade when you deserved a higher grade. Uh, if you have a, an issue with a particular grade that someone gave you, you think it's unfair, email me and I'll, I'll check on it. But I'll be looking over them either way. Now, the larger writing assignments, uh, the three basic essays, an annotated bibliography, and then a final revision, uh, these are all part of a larger project that uh, I mentioned earlier is your choice, something that you're interested in. It needs to be something that is not just a topic, not just uh, some information to put in a paper, but an issue, something that is up for discussion, a problem that needs to be solved, a, uh, a point of controversy, uh, or something like that where uh, maybe this is something a lot of people know and disagree about. Maybe this is something a lot of people think they know, but there's actually a, a new innovation or something that would change things. Or maybe you're making an observation that uh, most people don't, don't stop and think about when they do this thing or see this thing. Uh, that's what makes it an issue. It's, it's, it's an open question. Um, and if you have a, an absolutely, you know, firm uh, belief about the conclusion, it may not be the best issue. Uh, you want an issue that you can investigate with an open mind, that you can challenge yourself. Uh, you will be reading uh, the writing of people uh, for, with different perspectives on this issue. You'll be looking at the logical structure of their arguments. You'll be comparing them. Uh, you'll be gathering new data and comparing that data against old collections of data and, and that sort of thing. And this will be something that you will continue to research for the entire semester. So it should be something that you at least feel a little bit interested in. And each contribution, all the work you put into each uh, paper, uh, it doesn't just disappear when you're uh, done with that paper. When you submit the first essay, uh, it's not like all that, that work is just now, you know, is, is no longer relevant. It continues to be relevant. Uh, the rhetorical analysis you'll do in your first essay will be relevant when you put together your own argument in the second essay. And then in the third essay, you're going to write a proposal for how to adapt uh, the information in your second essay to a potentially hostile audience. And then in that final revision, you're going to write the type of essay that, uh, you know, presents a really strong, logical, fact-based argument, but tries to present it to people who might be motivated to dismiss it, people who really don't want to listen. Uh, we're going to try to look for strategies to uh, get them to listen and get them to participate in that conversation. All of these uh, essays are going to be in APA format. Now, that's the basic format. I'm not going to require you to write a, an abstract with an essay. Uh, you don't have to have a title page, but you definitely have to have the citation uh, format. And this, a lot of people learned MLA, the Modern Language Association uh, format in high school. Uh, we're gonna be using APA in here. And there are links here in the syllabus. There will also be links in each of the essay uh, descriptions once you go to read the essay uh, prompt. Uh, you will use the IPA format when you do the in-text citation, the parentheses with the author's name and the year. Uh, you'll also use it in the reference list. In MLA, that will be called the works cited. Uh, but in APA, is called the reference list, uh, the uh, list of the, the works that you cite in your paper that is uh, at the end. Uh, to submit your essays, go down to the essays section on the menu on the left and then click on the uh, title in order to submit. Now you can read the essay prompt as is. All you have to do is go to the, that section. Uh, but once you're ready to submit your essay, you'll click on the title, in this case, Essay 1, Rhetorical Analysis. Once you're there, uh, 
the really the only way to do this is to upload a file and the file needs to be either a Microsoft Word document or an Adobe PDF. Uh, you'll see there are a few other files that uh, this app can uh, process, but uh, Google Docs it, it can't take. Uh, and sometimes uh, when you use Google Docs and then save, uh, save it as a Microsoft Word uh, uh, .docx, uh, there are formatting problems. So be sure that you're uploading either a Microsoft Word document file format or an Adobe PDF file format. And once you do, uh, check in the browser and see if you can read it. If you can open it uh, and see it in the browser without using your software on your computer, if you can read it in the browser, then I can read it. If you can't read it, if it's just a blank screen, then I can't read it either. Uh, so if that happens and you've already uploaded it, uh, email me and let me know and I will take down uh, the blank file and you can upload it again. Um, I will say that you have access to Microsoft Word and all of Microsoft uh, Office uh, as a TAMU CC student. Uh, every single TAMU CC student has access to uh, Office 365. Uh, you just go to the uh, TAMU CC's uh, IT page and they'll have a link to get uh, Office 365. And that will allow you to use Microsoft Word uh, for free or at least, you know, incorporate it in your tuition. If you get an error message when you try to submit your file, uh, if there's a red banner at the top that says something like cannot access, uh, it might be that you've been logged out. So uh, you may have to refresh the page and it may ask you to log into Blackboard again. At that point, you should be able to go back to that same page and submit your file. And all of these essays are designed to be a sort of, you know, gradual uh, construction. Each one uh, becomes a foundation or at least a building block in the next. And that's going to require us to do a lot of research. It's going to require us to do a lot of rethinking of what we think we already know, uh, comparing arguments uh, that come to uh, opposing conclusions, evaluating counter arguments, uh, proposing our own arguments. Uh, you, you know, you are going to make your own claim eventually. It's not going to happen in the, the first essay. The first essay, the rhetorical analysis, you're going to analyze uh, someone else's writing, uh, someone else's argument. Uh, you're going to look at the logical structure of it, see how it works, see what the rhetorical situation is, uh, talk about how, you know, what works, what doesn't. Uh, but you're not making your own argument in the first essay. Uh, then you're going to gather more sources for the annotated bibliography. You're going to write about uh, how you can use these different sources in that annotated bibliography. Are you using them to support your own argument? Are you using them as counter arguments? Uh, and then in the second essay, that's when you make your argument about your chosen issue. You'll make a claim, you'll give the, the reasons behind it, you'll give the data, uh, you'll try to qualify it so that it enters into that conversation uh, in a way that it's not misunderstood, that it that actually addresses relevant issues, it addresses the arguments made by others and that sort of thing. Then in the third essay, you're gonna write a proposal. Uh, this is, uh, you're writing this to a different audience than your second essay. Uh, your second essay, uh, you're writing to uh, people who don't necessarily share your conclusion. And the third essay, you're writing to people who actually share your conclusion on, on that issue, but you're saying, hey, here's a better way to, uh, to make this argument. Uh, here's a problem, here's why people might resist our arguments to this conclusion, and here's a way around that. Uh, we'll talk all about those sorts of rhetorical strategies and you'll pick one and you'll sort of design your own and you'll write about it in the, the third essay. And then at the uh, very end uh, of finals week, or you know, you can turn it in anytime during finals week, you'll revise your second essay using the strategy you designed in your third essay. Uh, in which case you're not only making an argument, you're uh, testing a, uh, an innovative rhetorical strategy to uh, deliver that argument to people who might otherwise not want to hear it. And so this is all part of a process. It's a process of investigation, revision, thinking, rethinking, learning, relearning, questioning, and then asserting a claim, backing it up with uh, data, with evidence, uh, but evidence that is logically connected uh, in a, an identifiable structure uh, to a, a claim. And this may not be a claim that you have right now. You may not know where you're going with this. That's okay. In fact, that's uh, maybe better than if you think you know exactly what you're going to write and what your final conclusion is going to be. Uh, think of it as a process. Uh, the word essay, as I'll discuss later, uh, originally meant uh, a sort of process of testing something. And you can't, and you would have to test one thing against another. 
but this is our journey away from just being that lawyer on the back of the elephant uh just letting our non reflective cognition decide what we think and then just trying to rationalize it afterwards uh, we're going to get away from that uh, and we're going to get into a world where we share ideas with other people we can dispute with other people but do it in a way that is productive for everyone and most importantly we are now thinking about our own thinking we're thinking about other people's thinking and we're thinking about how to uh, get our minds in communication in dialogue with uh, the minds of others Okay, so now you know what to do. Uh, go back to Blackboard, read the syllabus, then go to the schedule, see what the first reading is. Uh, read that, watch the videos, get ready. And once you've uh, uh, done all the readings and watched the videos for the first week, uh, take the quiz and uh, look forward to hearing an announcement from me about the following week. And start thinking about what issue you want to spend this semester investigating.